good therapy isn't about the therapist solving the patient's problems because if you take that approach, a lot of the time you'll find that the professional is actually uh, projecting their own problems onto the patient. It has been ages since I posted a video. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. People that have followed my channel will know that I've been moving house. I've just had zero time to do it, but we're back into a routine now. You'll probably see I'm not actually coming from my new house. I'm in a uh, generic budget hotel on the Friday evening before Pride. However, I am going to film a video and I'm going to see if I can turn this around in the next 24 hours. Time will tell if that's actually worked or not. I put a poll out midweek to ask you what video you wanted to see as I get back into a new routine of filming and posting. Bojack won. Let's crack on. Hi, you. Hi, you. I love the diversity Long of the show. I lost them, Indira. Queer representation. All my years of corporate mediation, I've never been unable to resolve a dispute before it goes to arbitration. I'm Mary Beth, the mediating maven. I'm sure you help them in ways you'll never even know. Stupid alliteration. Don't therapize me. <laughs> Which are so easy. Doing therapy on people outside of work is just... Well, it's... Work. It's been a tough week. Tell me. Mm, I shouldn't talk about my client. True. Come on. What if you changed all the names and identifying characteristics? Convenient. Okay. This is a story about Bo 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 the angsty zebra. I wonder who might that be. <laughs> at least at no point was Bo Bo the angry zebra in a very, very famous TV show. Patient anonymity is really, really important and people often fall into traps with this on social media because they think just by changing the name or date of birth, for example, that that anonymizes the case. If the patient and the person that you're talking about can identify that it's them from the story that you're telling, regardless of whether you've used names, dates of birth, ages, or anything like that, then it's not anonymized. So it all started on Monday. I was in a session with Diane. Stereotypical. Yeah, Diana. On the couch. Uh, Diana. Doesn't Princess really happen. Exactly. It's just so tough being Princess of Wales. Our like, Lady I Di. all things to all whales. You're deflecting. I'm not deflecting. Let's talk about the Bobo tape. Most therapists probably wouldn't point it out and label it as deflecting in such a blunt way because that's actually solving the problem for the person. That's not what therapy's about. If it was me, and this might be really irritating, but it's the way that I would do it, is I'd likely pause and go, I wonder why we started talking about this, but we ended up talking about something completely different. Let that sit and see what comes out of it. It's helping that person get clarity about their thought processes and how their emotions link in with their thought processes and how that might be playing out in the conversation that you're having there and then. Help them search for the answers. Don't spoon feed them. Diana, you are not responsible for the dysfunction of others. I actually explore this in my book. Are you responsible for the dysfunction of others? Spoiler alert, you're not. It's like if I ended a session saying, don't forget to like and subscribe. <sighs> so yes, you're not responsible for the dysfunction of others, but again, She's solving the problem for her. She's telling her how to fix things. That's not what therapy's about. That's what, you know, vaguely unregulated life coaching might be about. Good therapy isn't about the therapist solving the patient's problems because if you take that approach, a lot of the time you'll find that the professional is actually uh, projecting their own problems onto the patient. Attention. As some of you might have heard, my mom died recently. I know you're all very concerned, but I want to let you know that it will not affect my work. I'm here and I'm doing fine. I just want to focus on the show. So please fine. treat this like any other day and be extra nice to me because I am a famous actor, not because my Don't mom died. Don't care for me. Care for me. Don't care for me. Care for me. Thank you. Good. Yes, that's what I'm looking for. Just go about your business. That's good because I don't want to talk about my mom. This reminds me of a couple of common scenarios that I encounter in my job. One of them is that you find that some people are really afraid to take that first step in asking for help because uh, that feeling of being vulnerable is so unconscionable. And then a range of different defensive mechanisms come out. People can rationalize things, normalize things. People can become angry, externalize things to push people away. The other one, and people don't think this is really allowed, but it's really common in human nature, which is to hold two contradictory thoughts at the same time. I want people's help and I want people's compassion. I don't want people's help and I don't want people's compassion. And you end up pulling people in and then pushing them away and pulling people in and pushing them away. I feel like he wants me to comfort him, but I'm still angry. Maybe you could both use some space from each other. Why don't you tell him you need to focus on your work? What work? Flippy won't let me do anything. Again, she's problem solving for her when actually she gifted her something on a silver platter there to talk about, which was the anger. Talk about the anger. Ah! 
Did you hear my mom died? How about this? If he wants to talk and you don't feel ready to confront him, tell him your therapist says you need space. That's where I went wrong. Yes. I inserted myself into her story. Don't yes. beat yourself up. Remember what Dr. Janet said? The thing that I am back on board with here is the fact that she's reflecting on those errors that she's making. Because we all make errors and we all sort of on this journey of self-discovery, whether we're having therapy, giving therapy, whatever it may be, you'll find that people that do psychological therapy should be actively engaging in reflective practice with colleagues outside of the sessions to explore exactly why some of these dynamics may be happening. Try and limit your own crap interfering with the therapeutic relationship that you've got. A self-aware therapist is a good therapist and a lot of that self-awareness comes in that reflection in between the sessions. So actually, most of the benefits and most of the hard work with psychotherapy for both the patient and the therapist happens outside of the sessions. How is there nothing to shoot? So what, I just have to wait around and be alone with my thoughts? Gross. Sometimes distraction can be helpful, at least in the short term. But the question though is at what point does using distraction become Longer term avoidance. Meanwhile, you want to go bang one out in your trailer? I'll get my diaphragm. No, nah, I'd just be thinking about my dead mom the whole time, which would either ruin it or, oh God, what if it makes it better? I don't oh want God. to know that. You want me Freud's to excited. Supply? No. Yes. Okay, big guy. <sighs> so you're saying that a Freudian slip is when you said one thing, but meant your mother? I'll get my coat. Psychotherapists with more charisma will get a big laugh at a conference with a joke like that. Hear me. Genuinely though, Freud's account of the Oedipus complex, which underpinned some of his psychodynamic theories about, about early childhood development, was that the mother is the first love object of the infant, and the father is the kind of first threat that's encountered towards that affection. And that's why pretty much everything in psychoanalysis comes down to, let's talk about a relationship with your mum. Oh, dude, your mom's dead. What? No, she's at a farm. Brutal. After a prolonged bout of Parkinson's. A farm where they don't have telephones or the internet. And oh my God, she's dead. My, my mom is dead. Oh, he just went on a right roller coaster journey of discovery and emotion there. But he's so outwardly expressive of those emotions. It's probably healthy. Hey, ah! what's going on with this submarine? My therapist doesn't want me talking to you. What? My therapist, Dr. Indira, says it would be good if my you therapist. gave me some space. Why would she say that? I don't know. I'm just the client. Her call, not mine. I should go. Externalizing some responsibility there. Dr. Indira. Endearing? Endearing? Is she endearing? It's got to be some sort of level to that name. Or in a classic psychodynamic way, am I completely overthinking it? Probably. I am incredibly fragile and could use all the support I can get. So Aww. if everyone could pay a lot of attention to me and ask me a lot of questions about the my mother, to Bojack's me, Yang me isn't mother, I think that would really make me feel a lot better. Sure thing, Mr. Chocolate Hazel, so that's sorry friend. for you, Lord. That's a very healthy way to grieve. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what is a healthy way to grieve? I suppose one criticism I have of a lot of the diagnostic systems, especially in the latest edition of the DSMs, the DSM-5, it has these arbitrary time windows in which you're allowed to have a normal grief reaction before it starts labeling it as something pathological. I'm not really convinced there is a normal way to grieve. In, and in that circumstance, I'm not actually convinced there's a pathological way to grieve. The real question though, is at what point does a normal and proportionate grief reaction to something really devastating and traumatic become depression that is treated in a very, very different way with a very different longer term prognosis? Uh, who do you think you are? I'm Dr. I know who you are. You know how many therapists there are named Indira? Google filled in your last name for me. Why did you tell Diana that she needed space for me? Would you like to have a seat? No, I don't Good want to have a seat. Good verbal de-escalation technique. Therapists are manipulative leeches. So when Jerry Lewis mistook me for the valet, he was carrying so much pain that I, I could never fathom. And that realization allows me to forgive, not for his sake, but for mine. In 45 minutes, the most emotionally stunted character in television history is having epiphanies in 45 minutes of therapy. Try several years of therapy. The have a seat was a good one though. So. When we do our postgraduate exams, and actually medical students do similar things, we have to do lots of different 
uh, practical exams and one station that we might be faced with is dealing with uh, an actor posing as a very angry and disgruntled relative about somebody's care and actually the test is about your ability to manage the consultation and your verbal de-escalation skills don't get defensive allow people to feel what they need to feel um, and help try and unpick what the problem is and a big part of that is the body language and the power dynamics that can come with one person standing up versus one person sitting down. Don't stand over somebody and be careful of your body language that can come across as hostile that then just inflames the whole situation even more. If you're a professional, it's your job to hold on to people's anger and not push it back towards them again. Don't get defensive. Mm -hmm. Wow, how long was I talking? I hope that was cathartic for you. You want to come back same time tomorrow? Wait a minute. I see what's going on here. Are you... My new best friend! So he's obviously feeling a lot of intense emotions with that, and then he has gotten it all off his chest, the so-called catharsis, but more than anything, he's obviously felt contained by the place that he's in and the relationship that's there. He's felt safe to be vulnerable. It's not uncommon, though, for people to then, over time, start treating therapists like friends or even like parents, there can sometimes even be romantic feelings that creep in. And we see this concept called a transference reaction where the emotions from one past relationship get transferred onto the therapist that now reminds you of that past relationship. So for example, if you've had a parent that you felt was very, very critical of you in the past, once you start seeing this therapist, if they challenge you with anything, you might start perceiving that as criticism and start treating that relationship in the same way that you treated that parental relationship. Not a bad thing, very, very normal, but something that's worth talking about in the sessions. Diana asked me not to be friends with you, so out of respect for her, I think it's best that I continue seeing you behind her back. <laughs> that's a secret We can still affair. totally do our lunchtime hangouts, but to cover our tracks, I'll compensate you for your time on the book so it looks like you're seeing a client. And just to be safe, we should invoke a therapist to friend confidentiality. How's that sound? There's these defense mechanisms of denial and normalization I think really trying to treat this as a friendship rather than therapy if I have to admit that this is therapy then I have to admit to being vulnerable I have to admit that there is something that I'm having difficulty with um, which is too damaging frankly for my ego to admit I'd rather treat it like a friendship where I'm a positive contributor rather than a passive recipient of somebody's care so in my dreams, I'm Philbert, and sometimes when I wake up, I don't know if I'm Philbert or if I'm me, or if I'm still dreaming. Oh, that's our time. A friendship hour. I'm just so glad that I can help break up your She's day to it. whiny babies with some entertaining lunchtime convo. Should I have told him what we were doing was therapy? On some yes. level, he must have known what was going on. What I don't You're understand avoiding. is, if you knew Diana asked him not to see you... I'm a therapist. A doctor heals, a DJ spins, Jessica Chastain takes whatever gig Amy Adams says no to. My job is to listen. And at that moment, Bobo needed someone to listen. That person doesn't have to be you though. Because arguably this is a conflict of interest. How much of her is liking being this sought after or afraid now that if she's open about this dynamic that's happening and where she's getting enmeshed in it, that she's going to lose everything and then her self-esteem plummets and she feels like a failure. But then if that's the issue, that's not being dealt with, then how much of that is actually being projected onto both of them during the session? You see how complicated these dynamics can get. And this is why reflective practice outside of therapy sessions is so important. A self-aware therapist is a good therapist. Yeah. Oh. Not emotionally naked. I knew it. Diana, let me explain. How long has he been your client? Not a client. Three sessions. Days. Friend. One for narrative, and absolutely not within most people's conscious awareness, at least until they've had a few weeks, probably a few months of therapy. Bojack's on the fast track route. It's amazing what cartoons can do. Is there anything you'd like to discuss with Bobo? We can do it right here. This is a safe space. No, is it? this doesn't feel like a safe space anymore. I can't keep coming here if I know you're also seeing him. What this makes me reflect on is sometimes, especially amongst academic circles, you can get people getting very carried away with, you know, what's the best evidence-based modality of psychotherapy? Is it cognitive behavioral therapy? Is it interpersonal therapy? Is it psychodynamic psychotherapy? And actually, the thing that matters most of all is a safe, containing, boundaried, 
professional relationship where trust is at the forefront of it. That professional relationship matters much more than the modality of therapy that you use. If people rigidly stick just to what's in a manual for one type of therapy and don't allow themselves to overlap with things and do it in according to what the patient needs or the client or whatever you want to label it, um, then you're going to get very generic, probably not very good types of therapy. The relationship matters first and foremost, and flexibility around the right modality is also important. Wow, I can't believe you chose Bobo over your client of seven years. At a certain point, I can't hold myself responsible for other people's dysfunction. I mean, that is kind of your job. But at least now you can help the angsty zebra, right? No, it's not the job. The job in this type of setting with this type of therapy is to help try and give that person clarity on why they're doing what they're doing and the thoughts and the emotions that contribute to that. Your job is not to reinforce a patient's externalization of blame to everybody else around them. In inpatient settings and people with severe mental illness, for example, um, there is a certain degree of risk management about someone's risk to themselves and to other people that we do have to take some responsibility for. But even then, you can't be, you know, there's no crystal ball to 100% predict what may happen. Responsibility should be shared. Unfortunately, it tends to end up being very black and white with everybody wanting somebody else to take responsibility. We tend to mirror each other a lot. You did the hard part, admitting you need help. Did I admit that? And now comes the even harder part, getting the help. Great. Let's talk about your mother. You know what? Oh. This has been great. She I went got straight what there. I wanted and I made so much progress, so I think I'm done. Um, yes, you did it. Uh, you changed my stripes. Dr. Indira, uh, you're great at your job. Goodbye forever. Self-esteem boost as the old fight or flight response kicks in, and he flights. He's dipped his toe in the water. It's been a little bit much, and maybe he'll come back at some point. She was right. You need her more than I do. And I think she can really help you. Help with what? I was just looking for someone to hang out with during my lunch. I didn't want some psycho-babbling quack job telling me to get in touch with my feelings. Who needs that? I, I do. I can safely say I've been called much worse. Probably this week at some point. Yeah, I'm not someone therapy works on. I might be too smart. Oh my god. You have Grandiosity. Whoa, 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 Diane. No, no, no. I'm not the problem here. None of this would have happened if I felt like I could talk to you. My friend. And externalization. Yes, again. I can't keep playing this game with you. You say you want to get better and you don't know how. Well, here's me, your friend, telling you how. Get therapy. In addiction, we use the trans-theoretical model or the stages of change model to think about where are our patients on their journey to treatment and recovery. But actually, it's quite translatable to other areas of mental health and mental illness, particularly where psychological therapy is at the forefront of what people need. So you have the pre-contemplative stage. People are not even really willing to think about whether they need to change or they need help. Contemplative stage, I'm thinking about it. Preparedness stage, okay, maybe I actually need to do something about it and not just think about it. Action, I'm doing it. And then maintenance stage is, I've done it, but I need to maintain what I've got. And it's about relapse prevention more than anything. I would put Bojack still at the pre-contemplative stage, dipping his toe into the contemplative stage. And I really like that we were hearing a lot of this from the therapist's perspective rather than purely from the patient perspective as well. But as usual, let me know what you thought in the comments below and we're going to be back to a routine of posting regularly. So I'll see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye.